Let us celebrate every day that Jesus' life, death and resurrection brings us forgiveness of sin and eternal life. May we live and use our gifts to worship God and to serve others, motivated always by God's mercy. We Amen. Say, Amen. So the reading today is from Romans 12, verses 1 to 8. The basics of ethics and advice on gifts. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading is from Matthew 16, verses 13 to 20. Peter declares Jesus to be the Christ. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Well, hi everybody. It's, uh, as I record this, it's Saturday night. It's become really apparent that I'm not going to be well enough to be at church on Sunday morning. Uh, thank you to those who are stepping in for that. Um, but I'll record the sermon tonight and you'll be able to see it in the morning. God bless you as you worship. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our readings today have skipped a bit since last week. Jesus attracted large crowds and he healed the injured and disabled people that they brought to him. He then fed 4,000 people with seven loaves and a few small fish. He got into a controversy with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he warned his disciples against their teachings. But after that period of intense public ministry, Jesus had time to be alone with his disciples. The focus now shifts from life amongst the crowds to life amongst the disciples and Jesus questions them to help them make meaning from everything that has happened. He begins by asking them, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Son of Man was his own way of talking about himself. He wants to know what the disciples understand about what the people understand about Jesus. What are the crowds saying about him? What's the societal attitude? How do the power brokers explain him? And the disciples reply to Jesus that the people think that he might be John the Baptist, or Elijah, or Jeremiah, or another of the prophets. 
Perhaps what they mean here is that the people think that Jesus is very like these characters. As we might say, he has the, the spirit of these characters. The people may even have simply believed that some of Jesus' message had the, had the fire of John the Baptist, the power of Elijah the miracle worker, or the warning about judgment of the prophet Jeremiah. It's also possible that in some way they thought that each of these characters would return before God's final salvation. And certainly there was a speculation about each one that they would be the forerunner to God's vindication on earth. Each one of these prophets was disruptive to the status quo, but this is a fairly positive picture of Jesus. The disciples, however, have left out the answer of those who believed that Jesus was insane, and there were those, or a rogue, or a blasphemer, or demon-possessed, or a disruptive, rebellious figure of sorts that needed to be dealt with. These two were attitudes towards Jesus. Still, today, as we look at the people around us, there are a variety of answers about who people think Jesus is. Some reject Jesus and his message. They cannot accept him as Lord, so they consider him a lunatic, or a liar, or maybe just a legend. Some even believe that every religious claim is evil. On the other hand, others do believe that Jesus is a prophet of sorts, Several religions treat Jesus as a messenger of God, but not as God himself, and not as the one who is at the centre of God's plan. Many non-religious people, and those who are on the edges of our Christian cultural heritage, also see in Jesus a great religious teacher, a, a figure of peace, a moral example, and other positive things. Indeed, sometimes even Christians are likely fall in to fall into the trap of only taking Jesus so far, but no further. And of course, many people just don't really know about Jesus, or see the relevance of knowing. But for the disciples, it's really the next question that makes all the difference. Jesus asked them, Who do you say that I am? That's a question that has several levels. It obviously makes an intellectual difference if we're prepared to admit, alongside Peter, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Of course, for Peter in that moment, the Son of God was probably just another way of saying God's chosen King, the Christ, the one to bring God's reign on earth. But now, of course, with the full revelation of Jesus, we can see that there's also a deeper sense in which Jesus is the Son of God. But to say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, implies so much more than merely an intellectual understanding. It is a truth that demands not just acknowledgement, but also allegiance. To really speak this truth demands a choice about it as well. It could be the choice of Peter to commit his life to this man. Or it could be the choice of the demons to acknowledge and tremble. But it is not a truth that can be acknowledged and ignored. To say that Jesus is God's anointed one is to say that the rule of God and the blessing of God will be found in relationship to him. It puts Jesus squarely at the centre of our lives. Whatever else we may value is now takes second place compared to him. And that's a lesson for our own lives. To acknowledge Jesus as Lord means that other things will not be Lord for us and that his will and his ways must have primacy in our lives. This is also a lesson for the church. That above all, what makes us the church is our focus on how God works amongst us in Jesus. There are all sorts of interesting theological and philosophical speculations we can engage in. There are all sorts of activities we can be busy with. There are all sorts of causes which we can commit to in the name of God. There are all sorts of ways of arranging our life together, both within our congregation and in our denomination. But the thing that makes us church is that Jesus is at the centre of our communal life together. It is Jesus and only Jesus that matters. When Peter speaks the words, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, 
Jesus affirms that this truth has been given by revelation from God himself. Peter therefore speaks in this moment with the voice and authority of God. And as he does so, it's on the basis of this insight, and more than that, it's on the basis of his confession and statement of allegiance to this truth, that Peter is named as the rock on which Jesus will build his church. It is not Peter as the man Peter. It's not Peter as the fisherman. It's not even Peter as a follower of a first century rabbi that is the bedrock of the church. Rather, it is Peter who speaks God's revelation of Jesus. It is that Peter who becomes the rock. The Peter whom Jesus makes, the centre of the band of the disciples, is the Peter who knows that really Jesus is the centre. To understand that Jesus is God's way of acting in the world changes everything. Against this proclamation, nothing can finally stand. Even the metaphorical gates of hell, that is, death itself, cannot stand against a community that is centred in Jesus. Jesus himself is building his church. He and the Father create faith in those he is gathering, and he builds a community that is centred around himself. This is a community in which God's gracious rule and reign is acknowledged, where it is served, where it is celebrated. And that celebration cannot be stopped even by death, because Jesus himself, as the book of Revelation tells us, holds the key to death and to hell, and he is able to save us from them. You see, to follow Jesus as a good moral teacher or a religious figure who taught about God does demand less of us. We can then just take or leave the teaching. But what that view gives us is in fact only rules to follow and a life to build for ourselves. But to follow Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, is more demanding. You cannot say that honestly without committing to him. But it also means that he can give us a life that lasts forever. To acknowledge Jesus as the Anointed One also means that we can be sure of our relationship with God. Peter could not have known at that point everything that was to come, but Jesus is the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth, and who has the keys of the kingdom to light and life. Through the proclamation of Jesus, and by faith in him, he has given authority to proclaim life in his name. In our passage today, he gave Peter the authority to speak his own message and with the authority to proclaim what he will achieve and the forgiveness of sins. In Matthew chapter 18, not long after this in the gospel, he gives this to all the disciples and he did it again, we're told, in John, that he gave this same authority again after the resurrection. And it's by that authority that Jesus gave us that we still in his name proclaim the forgiveness of sins to those who believe in Jesus Christ. We can, therefore, be sure that God considers us fully reconciled to him and in right relationship with him because of what Jesus has done. It also means that we can proclaim to one another whether that's in confession and absolution as we celebrate each Sunday in our gathering, or whether it's in our conversations with one another as we comfort each other's consciences and encourage each other, the acknowledgement of Jesus Christ sets us free. And in his name, we do have authority to tell people that that's the case, that their sins are forgiven. In some ways, we are now in the same situation that the disciples were in, in our gospel reading. There are all sorts of opinions about Jesus out there, and we know what many people think. So Jesus confronts us today with the same question. In the middle of all these various opinions, who do we say that he is? To ignore Jesus or to oppose Jesus, or even just to admit him, but only as a guru who gives optional religious advice, leaves us struggling to reconcile ourselves to God. But to know Jesus as the Christ gives eternal life and boundless forgiveness. 
who do you say that he is? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Pastor Matt's address has given us a reason to confess the Apostles' Creed. So let's stand and, uh, and we can confess that and say who we believe Jesus is. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you for adopting us into your family and growing our faith in you as we hear of your love and grace. Continue to send messengers to share Jesus' love with people everywhere. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord, we are weak, but you are strong. Protect your church in times of trouble. Protect and strengthen all who suffer persecution for their faith. Unite all the members of our families in faith and devotion to you, Lord. Guide each person to know the gifts you have given them and to serve accordingly. Give to each of us a clear sense of our gifts and calling. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this beautiful day that you've given us, this day where we can appreciate your sunshine, we can look at your creation. We give thanks to you for it. We ask that uh, you will help us to be faithful in our care of your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our yeah. prayer. Jesus, be with the people of Victoria as they struggle with strict lockdown measures. We pray that these measures will help bring an end to the suffering of many. Bring comfort and relief to all those who are struggling with sudden changes to their lives and protect all essential workers, essential service workers. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. <coughs> Lord, we pray for the families of those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Envelope them in your love and draw them close to you in their pain and loss. Help officials to locate and contain the outbreak and restore health to those afflicted with coronavirus. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Thank you for the schools and early childhood facilities, aged care and welfare services. Bless those who benefit from these and those who serve in them. Grant your blessing to the committee and staff at St. Mark's Early Learning Centre and bring all families to know your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Give health and blessing to those who live in the St. Mark's village. May it be a community of peace and contentment. Lord, we ask that you give health and blessings to the mainly music group of people, the mums with the children and Miriam and all those who help her. Lord, heal the sick and support those who, with, who have disabilities. Meet the needs of all we know who are in trouble and whom we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, move us to offer ourselves in service to you so that your love may be seen also through us. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now because we have a God that loves us, we're entitled to receive his blessings. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord continue to look upon you with favor and to grant each and every one of you his peace. Amen. Amen.